friends, uh, today uh, we will try and discuss the appeal process under the Right to Information Act. As we have uh, previously discussed, that uh, there are three processes put in place under the Right to Information Act to adjudicate uh, any grievances that may arise from the application of the right and the disposal of the same by the public information officer. And hence, when you look at the adjudicative process, it's quite a hierarchical process in which probably at the top is the Supreme Court of India, followed below are the high courts. As I told you that when the Central Information Commission is seated in Delhi, any challenge to the Central Information Commission's order is to the Delhi High Court. Whereas any challenge from the orders of the State Information Commission will go to the State High Courts, respectively. However, the second appeal under the Right to Information Act squarely lies at the Information Commission. And the first appeal lies at the first appellate authority, who happens to be heading the public authority or somebody who is in a senior position to determine the affairs of the public authority. And hence, the role of the first appellate authority who is over and above the public information officer becomes very critical or crucial to actually manage cases before the information commission. As we are quite aware of, the information commissions are quite overwhelmed with the number of cases, either they are complaint cases or appeal cases. And hence, there is a process uh, that has delayed the facilitation of the right to information through the information commissions. And hence, if the cases should not reach the information commissions, the role of the first appellate authority becomes very critical and crucial. However, kindly note, the first appellate authority is an executive officer of the organization, like the public information officer is not independently appointed, neither does he have autonomous powers as a judicial officer. The Right to Information Act is quite silent about the powers and functions of the first appellate authority vis-a-vis, -vis, say, the power to issue summons, examine witnesses, record evidences. However, when any role is casted on an executive officer to decide or adjudicate on any right, he has to perform the same in a quasi-judicial manner. It is his role to also apply the principles of natural justice while hearing any such appeal that comes before him. And hence, the executive officer who is designated as the first appellate authority is covered under the quasi judicial functions that are necessarily to be performed under the Right to Information Act. You will notice that the first appellate authority is discussed under section 19 of the Right to Information Act, and from the order of the public information officer, any citizen who is aggrieved by the such order or any third party who is aggrieved by such order can prefer an appeal to the first appellate authority. Now, the first appellate authority uh, is somebody who has to be approached, kindly note, within 60 days of the order of the public information officer reaching the citizen. This is the limitation time that is fixed under the Right to Information Act for any citizen to prefer the first appeal. So if the citizen does not reach the first appellate authority within 60 days, his right to appeal is exhausted. Interestingly, while a public information officer has to provide information within 30 days, the first appellate authority is also duty bound under the Right to Information Act to dispose the appeal within 30 days. This very clearly stipulates that the time frame has been clearly a preference and essence of the Right to Information Act. It is something that is expected of the first appellate authority that he does not consume uh, his own time in deciding the appeal and he disposes the appeal within the 30 days from the time it has reached him. As we ordinarily understand and know, whenever the limitation law uh, is prescribed either under the Limitation Act or under any other special law, there is always the possibility of condonation of delay. If reasonable grounds and uh, reasonable uh, excuses uh, like say a medical reason is provided for then the appeal may be admitted uh, even beyond the 60 days time. Now you will also notice that if the first appellate authority takes more than 30 days to decide the appeal he has to record the reasons for the same. There are certain possibilities uh, 
uh, in which the first appellate authority may not be able to decide the appeal within the 30 days uh, time. This could be cases like the cases where uh, the first appellate authority is in charge of the district and uh, he is probably involved in certain emergency or urgency action that the state wants him to undertake and he has not found the time to actually organize the appeal as the case may be. So if uh, he is uh, uh, given the task of hearing this appeal, sometimes he can also extend the 30 days for hearing the appeal provided the reasons are recorded in writing. You will also notice that the first appellate authority, interestingly, you know, this is always a question that is asked. Uh, how does the first appellate authority go about his business under the Right to Information Act? Now, first and the foremost, you will notice that uh, the first appellate authority has no power to impose penalty on a public information officer. So this is like a limitation to the powers of the first appellate authority. Right. So the power to impose penalty on the PIO under Section 20 is only with the information commissions. It is not with the first appellate authority at all. Right. So uh, the reading of the law is to be done in this cases that the first appellate authority is there only to do two things. First, during the appeal, he decides or he tries to evaluate why did the PIO not supply the information? What are the reasons? Are the reasons valid? Are they permitted under law or not? And hence, if he disagrees with the order of the public information officer, then the first appellate authority will order for the information to be disclosed. So he has to record why he disagrees with the public information officer. And once he disagrees, he passes an order to provide the said information to the citizen. Right. Uh, so please note the order uh, to supply the information uh, to the public information officer can be such. He may say that the PIO must supply the information within the next 15 days. Or he may order the PIO to supply the information then and there, which I think is a most preferred uh, method of hearing the appeal. So the first appellate authority has very, very limited intervention, though uh, it is limited, it is significant. And he can actually dose the fire uh, uh, and provide the right and provide the information. And he need not uh, see that the matter reaches the information commission. However, you will notice that, uh, you know, uh, because the first appellate authority is an internal person, is somebody who works within the organization, somebody who uh, probably heads the organization uh, and is a bureaucrat and things like a bureaucrat. Uh, there are very uh, few cases where the first appellate authority have actually disagreed with the public information officers. And hence the citizens generally don't find a purpose in taking a first appeal. And hence most of the time, uh, you will notice that citizens prefer the complaint mechanism rather than the appeal mechanism. So this is one kind of uh, a criticism or evaluation about how cases reach the information commission. As I told you in the past, an appeal process is completely different from a complaint process, right? So an appeal process uh, is something that you go in stages. So from the order of the PIO, you go to the first appeal. From the order of the first appeal, then you go to the information commission. However, in a complaint process, you uh, circumvent the first appellate authority. That means you directly reach the information commission without reaching the first appellate authority. So citizens don't find much purpose with the first appellate authority for this reason that the first appellate authority is a bureaucrat. He's a government officer. He is within the organization. He's somebody just higher than a PIO. And hence there is very less chances that he will disagree with the public information officer. Right. So that is where the complaint process is a preferred process for the citizen rather than the appeal process. Because again, as I told you, the appeal process is quite time consuming. For example, it is 60 days for an appeal, 30 days to decide. So nearly 90 days is what can be consumed in adjudicating the matter just before the first appellate authority. However, if you go to the information commission, probably at the same time, you will get the process adjudicated much faster. And the order of the information commission is enforceable as a law. Right. So that is what is generally a preferred mechanism. However, the law does provide for the first appellate authority to intervene and provide the information as the case may be. However, again, a limitation, the first appellate authority cannot recommend disciplinary action against the public information officer. Right. He can recommend disciplinary action as a general routine process under his organization, but not under RTA Act which is again an exclusive power vested only with the information commissions, right? So information commissions can impose penalty, can recommend disciplinary action. 
However, the first appellate authority cannot do these two, right? Now, kindly note that uh, an appeal before the first appellate authority can be either filed personally or individually or physically as the case may be, or it can be filed by sending the appeal through registered post as well. So citizen does not have to necessarily physically travel to file the first appeal. So this is something that is very clearly provided by law and it is the duty of the first appellate authority to entertain appeals uh, uh, without the physical presence of the citizen or without the necessity of the citizen to come in person to file that appeal. Interestingly, we have seen that the first appellate authority is also encouraged by certain decisions of the information commission to hold the appeal in a video conferencing mode so that there is less harassment for the citizen to travel to the actual proceeding of the appeal, right? So technology must be used, citizen must be least affected, least harassed, least uh, troubled, uh, especially when the appeal process is to be done. You will also notice that during the appeal, a notice has to be sent to the public information officer and the public information officer may be asked to appear and justify his actions. And that is what is the general process of what we call as the principle of natural justice. Now, if you uh, perceive, uh, you know, the time frame uh, under the Right to Information Act, uh, you will notice that the time frame of the Right to Information Act is uh, quite interesting. And uh, it is interesting and we will probably list it in five points, okay, so that we understand what is the time framework and how it appears in the first appellate authority stage. Now, let's assume that the applicant did not receive information within 30 days okay, uh, of uh, the request and uh, is aggrieved by the decision of the public information officer. Then in those circumstances, after the expiry of 30 days, right, you have to wait for 30 days to uh, wait for the PIO to give you the information. And then, you know, probably you wait for uh, an additional few days for communication. Uh, then within 60 days, uh, you have to file the first appeal. So this is the normal process. Let's is, imagine that the RTA application was submitted to an assistant public information officer. During this time, you will notice that the PIO uh, gets 35 days, right? So please note, after waiting for 35 days, uh, you can uh, prefer the first appeal. So that is the time frame. So 30 days for the PIO to respond. If it does not respond, then wait for an additional few days for postal transit, after which you can file the first appeal. Uh, if not, you can go to the uh, you know first appellate authority in those cases. Where the RTI application is transferred from one public authority to another public authority, this is under section 6.3. Then from the time the second public authority has received that application, you can wait for 30 days. Again, from that time, you get 60 days to go to the first appeal, right? So the transfer process is that you have to wait for the application to reach the second public authority. In those cases where notice is issued to a third party, right? So, you know, within the first five days of receipt of the application, the PIO has to send notice to the third party, right? So when he uses the first five days, he may take another six days for the notice to reach the third party. After the third party receives the notice, right, uh, then he has to respond to it, right. So in all of these, you will notice that the time is different, right. From the time you are aggrieved, from the time you think you have received the notice under the Right to Information Act, you get 60 days time to prefer an appeal, right. So in each case, the time has to be calculated as per the person who seems to be aggrieved by the actions or the order of the public information officer, right? So that's how you have to look at the process of calculation of time under the Right to Information Act. So for a third party, it's the time is going to be different. For uh, uh, an RTA applicant who has submitted it to an EPIO, the time is going to be different. And for a person who has submitted the application to a PIO, the time process is going to start completely different. Okay, so that is what this slide probably depicts and shares the same with you. Let's go further in trying to understand how the role of the first appellate authority is. Now, as per an uh, um, order that was uh, uh, issued in 2009, uh, this 
office memorandum did suggest that the responsibilities and the duties of the first appellate authority in deciding RTA appeal is that of a quasi judicial officer. It is necessary that the appellate authority should see this as a process of rendering justice and equity. And in case he finds that justice and equity has not been done by the public information officer, then it is his duty to pass a speaking order. Right? So you will notice that the first appellate authority is like a judge in a court of law and he is not there hearing this matter in an administrative capacity. He is hearing this matter in a quasi judicial capacity and hence the order that he finally makes should be a judicial order. It should be a speaking order and it should provide justifications for the decision to arrive at. Right. And it is uh, expected that the first appellate authority uses the provisions of the law to provide the justification provisions of both administrative law, if possible, constitutional law, if necessary, and most importantly, the right to information act as the case may be. Now, the next important uh, issue or query that most of us may have under the right to information act is that will there be a fee for the first appeal, right? Because there is a fee for information that is 10 rupees is the application fee, 2 rupees is the uh, information fee per page. So what is the appeal fee, right? Now, interestingly, under central government uh, rules, that is the RTA rules of uh, 2012, there is no fee for first appeal at all, right? Though the appeal is free. However, certain states can prescribe those kind of rules for uh, fee for the first appeal. So I think every state rules have to be perused to know whether there is a fee for appeal. Most states do not have it anyway, but that is something that I have to clarify at this point of time and probably one will have to check each state to know whether there is a, a fee for the first appeal, right? So that is uh, left to the uh, discretion of the state governments. Kindly note that the law does not prescribe any qualification for the first appellate authority, okay? Like uh, we have seen the qualification for the information commissions, right? There is no prescribed qualification. Uh, so it is up to the public authority to determine who shall be the first appellate authority. Second, you know, interestingly, the law does not uh, require any training or prior training to be uh, a first appellate authority. Right? Very often they're not in the first few years of the Right to Information Act. We found that the first appellate authority were clueless about their role and function under the Right to Information Act. Right? Because there was no qualification necessary. Uh, there was no training that was given to them. And uh, naturally, you know, citizens had the only hope in the information commissions. So I think... Uh, uh, any such law that is made must always look into the matter of qualification and training so that the officers who then act as quasi judicial officers and who are expected to render justice and equity must actually do so uh, in the best of their abilities and in the best of their knowledge. Uh, there are challenges to the first appellate authority because interestingly very often than not the first appellate authority is the boss to the PIO and uh, we have seen cases where uh, as a boss, he has misused his office and he has uh, not rendered it in an impartial, unbiased manner. So there are many uh, citizens who have complained uh, about the attitude of the first appellate authority, which is nothing but an extension of uh, what uh, is the hierarchy in a government organization. Uh, can, okay, so the next very interesting issue is can a PIO prefer a first appeal? Right. So the citizen can go and first appeal. Can a PIO go and first appeal against his own order? Right. So I think, you know, when you look at the term aggrieved person, uh, an aggrieved person can be any individual. It can be a third party. It can be a citizen. Uh, but, you know, when we talk about a PIO, uh, generally PIO has passed an order against his own order. He cannot go in first appeal. Though he can be an aggrieved individual, kindly note, uh, uh, as against going to the information commission, right? How is he an aggrieved individual before an information commission? Suppose the first appellate authority reverses the order of the PIO, right? Then the PIO can go in appeal to the information commission, right? Uh, because the PIO and the first appellate authority differ in their opinion. Uh, however, uh, to the first appellate authority, I don't think the PIO can go because against his own order there is no appeal that is provided to the public information officer so that was decided in this uh, 
Elza uh, CTIO versus Board of Excise and Customs. It's a case decided by the Central Information Commission in 2008. It very clearly said that uh, under Section 19 of the Right to Information Act, uh, under the term aggrieved individual, uh, the aggrieved individual can also be a public information officer. However, that aggrieved individual as a PIO is only towards the second appeal and not on the first appeal. Now, the process of the second appeal is interesting. The RTA rules of 2012 passed by the central government uh, does uh, establish this process. And uh, you will notice that under Rule 10, it says that on receipt of uh, a, an appeal, uh, the commission, if uh, it is not satisfied that it is a fit case to be proceeded with, it may after giving an opportunity of being heard to the appellant and after recording its reason, dismiss the appeal. Right? So it is not necessary that all appeals must be adequately and appropriately heard. Prima facie leave, the appeal does not have any substance and prima facie leave, the information commission thinks that uh, the appeal does not have a substantial, uh, uh, you know, uh, grievance, then, uh, you know, the uh, information commission can reject the appeal and dismiss the appeal as the case may be. Uh, however, please note, it is the duty of the information commission to give grounds when it actually dismisses such appeal, right? So that is very important. So the RTA Act does not mandate that the information commission must accept all appeals and uh, give it a proper hearing. So summarily, if they feel that the appeal does not have uh, any uh, substantial question uh, for their intervention or is probably frivolous, vexatious, uh, or is uh, not based on adequate, uh, you know, appropriate grounds, and in those cases, the appeal can be dismissed. Now, this Rule 10 under the RTA Rules 2012 also applies to the first appeal. So, if at this stage of the first appeal, the first appellate authority thinks that uh, the PIO has done its job very well and the citizen's grievance is just, you know, uh, uh, you know frivolous or it is meager and does not require his intervention, then kindly note, he can also dismiss that appeal, right? So, this is summary disposal of the matter without a adequate, proper, substantial adjudicatory process being followed, right? So that is how appeals can be decided, right? So it all depends upon the merits of the case. So in the first appeal and the second appeal, if there are no merits that are found prima facie, the commission and the first appeal authority are uh, having the prerogative to dismiss the appeal as the case may be. Kindly note, the commission shall not consider any appeal unless it is satisfied that uh, the appellant has availed all other remedies available to him under that. So exhaustion of all other remedies, for example, you know, communicating with the PIO and telling him that what information has been provided is not sufficient, right? Just, you know, you cannot uh, keep, uh, you know, preferring appeals on small and trivial matters. So I think it is the duty of the citizen to also inform the PIO whether he has been satisfied or not, whether there is inadequacies which the PIO can remedy. Right? So, you cannot just uh, on trivial or on matters that can be uh, normally re resolved between the citizen and the PIO, prefer appeal. Appeal has to be on a substantial matter. Appeal has to be on a grievance uh, that the PIO has not taken into account or has uh, dismissed to, uh, you know, uh, uh, address. Uh, right? So, if that is what the PIO has done, an appeal can be done, not otherwise. What are the documents to file an appeal. Very interesting, isn't it? So kindly note, I think this is a procedural issue that uh, we all should know before we appear before the information commissions. Uh, kindly note, these are the following documents that would be required in case you decide to file an appeal uh, under section 19 to the information commission. Uh, the list uh, has around six documents uh, that have to be attached. So uh, procedurally, this looks to be cumbersome, but I think these are basic documents that are necessary uh, for any quasi-judicial body to undertake an appeal. The first one is that when you file an appeal, you should have a copy of the application itself, right? So whatever you have submitted to the public information officer, you should have a copy of the same. So I think it is the duty of the citizen to at least uh, have two or three copies of the application made, right? So that when appeal is decided, he can say, okay, this is my original application. Second, I think uh, whatever uh, the PIO has communicated or whatever reply the PIO has given, it could be an interim reply, it could be the final 
uh, reply of the PIO in which the PIO has finally adjudicated on the matter or provided the information or not provided the information or has transferred it. So anything uh, uh, of a communication that the PIO has done, a copy of the same has to be attached in the IP. Right? Third, if uh, the citizen has preferred the first appeal, then a copy of the appeal to the first appellate authority must also be provided. Obviously, when you have given uh, the first appeal or gone to the first appellate authority, the first appellate authority will also give you a, a, a order. So that also has to be attached. Then fifth, then if there are any uh, documents that you think uh, will be important for the commission to rely upon, right? If there are any previous judgments on this matter and the PIO has not uh, adhered to those judgments and the PIO has denied you that information. However, in some other case, the information commission has already said you must provide it. Right? So if there are any other documents, then you should also attach those documents so that the information commission may take an informed evaluation of the case and may decide in your favor, right? So this is something that has to be done. And finally, um, the normal judicial process is to have an indexing of the document so that there is a very clear appeal process. I think these are documents to file the appeal. Now you have to frame the appeal yourself, right? Uh, what are the grounds? How do you uh, expect the information commission to help you out? I think the petition for appeal must be drafted following the documents of appeal, right? So documents of appeal are only attachments. However, the petition of appeal has to be drafted by the citizen himself. Again, if you look at the procedure for deciding appeal, normally the procedure for deciding appeal can be decided by the information commission. However, the RTA rules additionally say what should be the process, right? This is some kind of a rule that uh, uh, the information commissions are bound to follow. Uh, the commission while deciding an appeal may, please note, receive oral or written evidences on oath or on affidavit from the concerned or interested persons. Oral evidence can be done orally through video conferencing or physically or the commission may say oral evidence is not required, we will take the written evidence right, through the form of an affidavit. Right? So the commission has a, a prerogative to decide whether they want oral evidence or written evidence. So when it is done orally, I think uh, you, whatever is said will be recorded by the commission or its officers. When it is uh, taken in an affidavit, it becomes very easy because it's a document of evidence that is acceptable. So the commission has a discretion to do either of it. Correct? Second, the commission may peruse or inspect documents, public records or copies thereof. So the PIO may be asked to get these records and documents. Uh, though the PIO is not shared with the citizen, he may have to share it with the information commission for the commission to evaluate whether it should be provided or not. So they can peruse or inspect any documents as the case may be. Third, very interestingly, can the, uh, you know, can during appeal uh, an inquiry be done? Uh, the answer is yes, uh, uh, it can be done. So we have already discussed under the powers of the information commission, how an inquiry can be done and in what cases an inquiry can be done. However, the only precaution over here is if the commission decides to hold an inquiry, it cannot delegate this power to any other officer. It has to be done by the commissioners themselves. So the power to inquiry cannot be subdelegated is what the courts have very clearly observed. So the information commissioners must exercise the power of inquiry themselves and not through any other office. Uh, they can hear the uh, PIOs. Uh, that is definitely possible as the case may be. They can hear third parties as well. Right? Uh, they can uh, receive evidences from any other person uh, who can or whose assistance has been sought under the Right to Information Act. Okay? So this is under Section 5.4 and 5.5. I told you that uh, there can be the position of a deemed PIO as well. So any other officer's evidence may also be required to adjudicate that matter or to adjudicate that process as well. The presence of uh, the appellant uh, before the commission is uh, something that is a discretion. Now rule 12 of the Right to Information uh, Act rules of 2012 uh, states that the appellant shall be informed of the date of hearing at least seven days in advance. This is the minimum notice time right, for the uh, appeal to be heard. And he may come in person or through video conferencing. That is a choice that has to be made available to the appellant. And uh, uh, if 
you know, the commission cannot force the appellant to come in person. That is the, uh, you know, uh, uh, something that you'll have to uh, notice. Also, if the appellant wants to appear in person and cannot come on the date that the commission has fixed, right, he can ask for a uh, you know, new date as well. So that kind of uh, uh, process has to be put in place and the commission may afford the appellant another opportunity to appear before them. So uh, the date that is fixed is not going to be final. I think it can be negotiated and the appellant may say that it is inconvenient for me to come on that day. Can you please fix another date? So another date and another opportunity of being heard before a final decision is taken is something that the commission is bound to do. Other aspects of the appeal, these are the concluding uh, aspects that we will just take note and uh, consideration of. I am discussing this because the RTA rules of 2012 state the same. The public authority may authorize any representative to appear on behalf of them. So this is an opportunity that the public authorities have. See, generally the public authorities are represented by the PIO, but the PIO and the public authority may differ. right? Uh, so in those cases, if the public authority feels that its interest is going to be adversely uh, decided and the PIO is not capable, as, capable of advancing the interest of the public authority, then in those circumstances, the public authority may authorize any representative uh, of its organization to be present in the case. Because please note, a public authority is also or can be an aggrieved person in an appeal. Because finally, the information that is going to be shared is that of the public authority, isn't it? So the PIO, uh, uh, if he is not in tune with the policies of the public authority, then in those circumstances, the aggrieved uh, uh, agency will be the public authority. Rule 14 also says that the commission may issue notice by name, which shall be served like this, right? It can be served to the party itself. It can be hand delivered. It can be through the server. It can be by post or it can be electronically as well. So kindly note, any notice that is served to individuals or to uh, the parties uh, before the case can be served notice by all these means. So I think the electronic means of communication of serving notice is the easiest thing. It uh, uh, is less time consuming, it's less cumbersome and I'm sure it is cost effective as well. So uh, citizens should be aware that a notice to appear before the commission or to hold the appeal or to conduct the appeal date can be served electronically as well. So the rules give this power to the information commission as the case may be. Finally, kindly note, you will see that the penalty on the PIO under section 20 uh, can be imposed by the information commission. Uh, however, uh, in this manohar, uh, Anchul versus State of Maharashtra. Uh, it's a case of 2012. The Supreme Court warned that information commissions should not impose penalty merely because the PIO has sought an adjournment of the appeal. Yeah. So what happens is, uh, you know, the information commissions think that the date fixed for appeal is the final, and that cannot be negotiated or refixed or adjourned on the request of the PIO. So in this case, unfortunately, the Maharashtra Information Commission said that the PIO is seeking an adjournment of the appeal and is not uh, serious. And uh, they uh, felt that uh, this case deserves penalty to be imposed on the PIO. But the Supreme Court very clearly said, sorry, I think this is provided under the RTA rules that uh, there can be an adjournment that can be sought, a new date can be fixed. If the PIO can justify that it is inconvenient for him to appear before the commission, or uh, substantiate the case as the case may be because the PIO may want to prepare for the appeal as well. So the time given may not be adequate enough for the PIO to make his defense. In those cases, if he, uh, uh, you know, by giving adequate justification seeks an adjournment, uh, the PIO shall not be acted upon is what the Supreme Court has very clearly warned the information commissions as well. So an opportunity of hearing the PIO is definitely an opportunity that the PIO can insist upon, can plead uh, with reasonable causes and uh, this shall not attract any adverse action on the public information officer by the information commission. Right. So what we have discussed today friends in this short presentation is the process of appeal, especially the process that is applicable to the first appeal, to the second appeal as well. We have discussed what are the documents that are required in the appeal process. 
We have looked at uh, whether an appeal can be summarily dismissed if it does not have any merit. Uh, we have also discussed the limitation of the powers of the first appellate authority. Uh, they are not the same as the second appellate authority, right? So the first appellate authority can only limit in terms of uh, disclosure of the same set information. We have also discussed who can come in an appeal, whether there should be an exhaustion of local remedies or not. And finally, uh, all this discussion are important in tune with the RTA rules of 2012, which the central government has passed, in which the process of appeal has been very clearly laid down, right? And uh, I think the penalty under Section 20 is towards uh, the delay in giving information and not towards any kind of uh, uh, error, omission, or adjournment that can be sought by the PIO during the appeal process, right? So this is what uh, this short presentation has uh, looked into.